Uh, thank you. Now, my special guest tonight is a Hollywood superstar, dynamic, versatile, and gold dust at the box office. He was recently voted in the top three of America's most popular stars of all time, along with John Wayne and Harrison Ford. Welcome, please, Mel Gibson. <laughs> Shall we quit while we're ahead? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just mentioned there, I mean, it's, just, uh, it's amazing and wonderful. The top three, in the top three of, of Hollywood stars of all time. I hadn't heard that. Have oh, you not heard that no, one? No, I'm there with the Duke, that's all the right. The Duke. Yeah. Now, you like the Duke, did yeah. you? He was my boyhood hero, wasn't he? Yeah, Duke. absolutely. Good man. Yeah. But was that a part of your childhood? Did you ever imagine, perhaps, when you were young and growing up, that you'd be a film star, that you'd be this huge star? No, not at all. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I was an avid fan of, I, I caught most of my uh, uh, old movies on black and white television, you know. Because yeah. there was a bunch of us and we, did, we couldn't even afford a color TV, but we used to crowd in front of the black and white. And, uh, so that's how we got it. A bunch of us being the family. Yeah. It was a big family. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. How many? I got uh, 10 brothers and sisters. Yeah. <laughs> a crowd of us. Yeah. A crowd of us. And what was it like growing up in that big family? We're now in America, aren't we? That's where you were born. That's where you, yeah. you, you grew up. New York State. New York State. Not in, the, not in town. I never even went to the city until I was 12 years old, you know. But it must have been tough for your parents, because it was not a rich family, was it? No. But uh, they did well enough to keep us all fed and roofed and uh, shod and uh, everything else. So they're, you know, hardworking people. They didn't really have a lot of time for themselves. Uh, you know, they wouldn't just go out and go to dinner or, uh, you know, kick up their heels, go dancing. My dad couldn't dance anyway. Was, um, uh, but they uh, uh, were certainly very generous with us, so, hey. But your mum didn't have any help. I mean, uh, what kind of pressure was that, having ten kids to wash for and feed and look after? Uh, she actually had four hands. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she needed four hands. It was, um, but, the, of course, uh, the, she was fortunate in that uh, uh, most of my sisters were born early. And, uh, <laughs> and they were kind of like surrogate mothers, you know. There was, there was three of them, and, they, uh, and the youngest of those three was nine years older than I was. So that uh, by the time I came along, and then uh, right behind me, there's, a year behind me, there's a set of twins, and a year be uh, behind them was another brother. So there were four little kids all in diapers or nappies or whatever you call them here. Nappies? Nappies, yeah. Nappies, yeah. Yeah, uh, all at the same time. So it was, uh, it was chaos. It was bedlam. So she had these... Uh, able-bodied young women to sort of help her. So they were all like mothers feeding us, taking care of us. So. There's a lovely story in, 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 in the research I read about your mother one day actually cracking under the pressure. Of oh, the yeah. What was it? Yeah, she just... Uh, I was with my dad, because he, he, uh, he's a bit of a, a book guy. He likes... He's got all these reference books, and he's at the typewriter banging away. And, um, I'm in there asking him what he's doing, and he's explaining something to me. And we're looking out at the sunroom in Australia, and uh, I saw her wander out of the laundry room with a bundle full of clothes and she just put them on the footpath. Very calm she was. And she went back in and got another bunch and put it on. She, she went back three or four times and I said, what, what's she doing out there? And he said, well, oh, I don't know. And then she came very calmly back out with a can of lighter fluid and squirted it all over. <laughs> and she had some matches and then she like, just lit it and watched it burn. And there was like a, a sense of satisfaction for her. I guess she was you know, so many years inundated with the laundry for, uh, you know, like, you know, 12 other people. Yeah. It was like, uh, yeah. it, it, she cracked one day and said, I've had enough. Well, what about, was it about your dad? Because he, he was plainly a, a remarkable man. I mean, he, yeah. he, he, was, he worked as a brakeman on the railway. Yeah. Had an injury. Yep. And then? Well, you know, he, uh, he was unable to work because of a, uh, an injury. He slipped over and, and it wasn't his fault. It was uh, through neglect. So he, um, he had an accident, really hurt his back. So, you know, for a while, you know, he was, he was on his back and it was hard to get by. But, uh, you know, he eventually got a settlement from the railway and um, took us off on a trip around the world. But in the meantime, because for a guy who's a railway brakeman and who has a knowledge of, like, almost fluent Latin and a uh, pretty good knowledge of Greek, uh, classical Greek, um, and uh, a smart guy. I mean, uh, photographic memory, almost. Um, uh, so he said, well, you know, since I'm not throwing switches on railway trains, he said, I think I'll, uh, he went on a game show over in America, and he kept winning. 
This is Jeopardy, the game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, he, uh, he cleaned up, and then they made him get off, because there's a finite kind of thing. <laughs> get off. And then they brought him back at the end of the year so he could compete with all the other guys that won. And he beat all of them as well, so... He did all right. He's a smart guy. And then he took you all away. He uplifted the family, and away you went and toured, toured the world a bit. Yeah. yeah, we came over here, you know. All we, of you? Yeah, all of us. Everybody. <laughs> it was a real train, you know. Yeah. Like, uh, and you came here to England? Yeah, it was like Genghis Khan's troops moving in, you know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and I was always getting lost in airports. And I got lost in Blackpool. I got, I got lost in Glasgow. I, got, I kept getting lost because I was a dreamer. I'd sit there and be looking at something and they don't wander off and catch a plane without me. <laughs> like, uh, and then you went to Australia. You settled there. Yeah, just outside of Sydney, you yeah. know, 20 well, miles. What out. was it like? Because now, how old were you when you, when you moved to, to Australia from America? Twelve. Uh, Twelve. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's an entirely different culture, isn't it? So, to, what was it, a culture shock for you, moving from America to, to, to Australia? Um, it took a little adjusting, I think. Uh, um, but it's not so different. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, the United States and, and Australia are both sort of like dumping grounds for here. You know, they were sort of like, they were, well, it's true. They were like, they were like penal settlements. You know, they used to uh, get rid of all their undesirables and send them over there. But uh, one place had a revolution and the other place is still part of the Commonwealth. But, but quite separate, really, um, by virtue of geography. But, but what about the, the, the kid growing up in Australia? I mean, I mean were you, a, were you a, a problem child? Were you a, at school? Did you like school? Do you have any ambition for school? I mean, I hated school. You did? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really didn't understand why I needed to be there. It was no. a, a tremendous <laughs> drudgery for me. All twelve years of high, you know, school and high school, it was like, uh, and I was with the Christian brothers. You know, oh, that'd be nice. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> rough bunch. Very strict, aren't they? Very strict. Yes. Yeah. You get be beaten regularly. You used to get whacked around a fair bit. Yeah. 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 And uh, that, you know, that was before they brought in laws. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and some of them were great men, really great men. And others were just like power mad fiends. I mean, it's as, you know, good or bad. It, it depends on their personalities, you know. Yes. Some of them are great mentors. But, but there's this, so there's this, this kid uh, who doesn't like school, doesn't see the sense of it. But, no. but, 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 but what does he see the sense of? What does he want to be? Uh, well, did you know? Yes, I did. Uh, you did? I you did. knew what you wanted yeah, to do? You did. wanted to do this? Well, from you? the age of 12. Wow. Yeah, not this, because it wasn't invented. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to write, you know. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I did actually have, um, uh, you know, the journalist idea was kind of exciting to me. Because, really? Yeah, well, I developed a love for travel early on, you know, just by traveling to Europe and around the world and so forth. Um, and I, uh, that, to me, was exciting. I loved the smell of airports. Yeah. I hate them now. I mean, yeah. it's a, so I've totally outgrown that one. <laughs> You know, when they want to do cavity searches and things in these day and age. <laughs> so now it's, the smell of airports is hateful. But uh, the, the uh, um, so I had this ambition to sort of like trot the globe and, and look at interesting things and put myself in harrowing situations. But uh, I found that uh, this is good enough. <laughs> what, what sort of jobs did you do there? You worked in a, a bottling factory, you know, fruit factory. Fruit oh, juices. yeah, yeah, fruit juices, yeah. Fruit juices. Fruit juices. Uh, I did... Uh, um, Military service. I I, uh, I worked under the colonel at the KFC. You know, <laughs> uh, you know eleven secret herbs and spices. You know. Ah, uh, yes, I remember the colonel well. Yeah. Um, you know, the cook in the Kentucky Fried Chicken and and uh, uh, working in fruit juice factories. Uh, you know, pretty manual, boring labor. Um, but you know, I think it's important to to do those kinds of things. They, it certainly inspired me. You know to say, well, I don't want to get stuck here. I want to do something else that... Yeah, and, uh, and also, too, I mean, it gives you, I would imagine, a sense of proportion, doesn't it? I indeed, mean, yeah. I mean, that's, you would look back from where you are now to where you were, and, and, and you, you see the tap root and you learn from it, which is, I mean, again, it's the problem of having children, isn't it, from the, your position that you are now, you yeah. wonder what their perspective is, but that's something we'll talk about in, in, in a moment. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, but, but uh, at this time, of course, we're talking as you are growing up there, Vietnam was, yeah. was, was happening. Um, there's a story that, that your father took him to Australia to, to avoid being drafted for Vietnam. Is that, is that true? No, not wholly. I, we wouldn't have avoided it. No. It's as simple as that. Why it was, is that? Uh, yeah, well, you, you couldn't. Uh, uh, you could go to Australia. You could be a permanent resident down there. You didn't even have to be a citizen. They could still draft you. Yes. Um, the only um, good thing you got from it was that... Uh, the only concession was that you got drafted a year later yes. in your life. Yes. So that... Uh, I think you were 20 before you got drafted there, but whereas you could get 18 or 19 in the United States. Mm -hmm. So 
It wasn't really an escape, it was just a stall. And uh, he went to World War II, of course. He went to Guadalcanal and, uh, you know, didn't like it much. No. As, Why would he? No sane person would, I don't think. No, but, uh, that's right. And he certainly didn't want it for his children, as I wouldn't want it for mine. I mean, who wants to send their kids off to war? But um, um, uh, clearly didn't like the idea of that particular conflict. It's interesting now looking at your latest movie, of course, which is about Vietnam. It's yeah. about the start of the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It's about the time before the conscripts got involved. It's, right. it's the... I think I'm right in saying was it was the it was the last regular or first and last regular encounter of a big battle by American troops on the on the on the Viet Cong. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the, the the man who you play in this, Hal Moore. Well, he's a uh, he's a retired general. His name is Harold Moore, and uh, he's quite a remarkable man. I mean, uh, when I read the book, I thought, well, this guy's kind of hard to believe, you know. Um, I uh, I had the good fortune to meet him, and not only meet him, but sit down and and pick his brains for hours and days and weeks uh, and really get to know him on a pretty intimate level, which is like uh, he helped me to, um, to view that whole conflict and his experience of it because I've never been to a, in a situation like that, thank God. But uh, he, he, uh, he allowed me to, to view it and see it in a very, so that it became a very profound experience for me as it was for him. Um, but wow, I mean, uh, wow. Uh, what courage, what, what, uh... He's in charge of the 7th Cavalry, which is Custer's old, yeah. old, old Custer's regiment. Custer's old regiment, yeah. And it's, it's, it's frankly, a, a, almost an unbelievable story. When, I mean, it's based on facts, so it, it's true. Yeah. But when you see, I mean, they were lured into a valley against overwhelming odds, they fought yeah. their way out of it. Yeah. What's it, what's it like? And he's still alive, as you said, Halmore. I mean, you're, you're playing a real yeah. live hero. Um, did he see the film? He did. He did. And what, and you were with him? And, and yeah, what? yeah, he was very proud of it. I, I was, uh... The first time he saw it, I, I was, it was a rough cut. I was sitting behind him and I saw him like moving around and checking it out, squirming in his chair. And uh, a lot of the guys had to leave, you know, they were getting flashbacks and things. But, These are uh, guys who had actually been in the, in the, in yeah. the battle. Oh yeah, they were Oh, there. right. And Hal's, um, he was old to be there at that time. He was 43, 44 years old when he was in Vietnam. Um, but I, you know, just as the lights were coming up, I thought I'm gonna make a hasty retreat. And I bolted out the back of the theater and I went to the men's room thinking that heat would blow over and maybe he wouldn't notice me. I was really concerned that he wouldn't be pleased with it. I, I really so didn't want to disappoint him. And it, uh, you know, I'm having a nervous twinkle in there, wasting time, you know. <laughs> and he's throwing away the paper towel and I'm just about to exit, figuring the heat is gone. And he walks in, he's the only other guy in the men's room. And we're sort of facing each other. I go, hey, Hal, how are you doing? I put my hand out and he says, you wash your hands. <laughs> I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> and and he, 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 he's tough because he, he sort of, he, he, he could see my, my nervousness. So he, uh, he kind of let it sit there for a while and then he, he told me he dug it, you know. So if he gives a thumbs up, you know, that's okay with me. L let's, let's go back to, the, uh, to that time when you're working the fruit juice factory and all that sort of stuff in Australia. Yeah. Um, I mean, did you ever have the ambition to be an actor? I mean, was it your ambition? Well, in, in fact, I, I, was, uh, I was already at drama school and we got cut loose for four months. So that that was the job I had to have in order to sort of pay to for the second year to yeah. survive. Um, I wouldn't have ever gone there otherwise. It was just inhuman. It was like four in the morning till eight at night. And I was living on Swiss cheese sandwiches and cornflakes. <laughs> you know, you start to get scurvy like that. <laughs> and I think, I know, orange juice, but I couldn't stand the smell of the stuff, you know. Um, uh, it certainly, it really, and the first year I was uh, at that institution that I went to to learn that craft was, uh, um, I was ambivalent about it. I wasn't sure quite, but after uh, four months in the juice factory, I loved it. You did? Yeah. <laughs> it's an pleasing alternative. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And what about, what about then the, I mean, the, the big break that you had was, of course, when you, when you got Mad Max. That was, the, yeah. that was the thing that started it all off for you. Now, you'd done films before that. Sure. But how do you get, how, why do you laugh? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> are, are they buried? Have you bought them up and buried every copy? No, I haven't bought them up and buried them, but... Uh... You wish you had? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but, but what about Mad Max? Because the, 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 the audition you, you attended in less than uh, perfect condition, I understand. No, that's true. Well, I, I, I didn't even go to the... I wasn't called to the audition. I was going north of the bridge, and I hopped a ride with a guy who was going to the audition, and he went in, and uh, I just went up into the waiting room and just waited for him, and I was talking to the girls at the desk, in, um, in the casting office and they said, what happened to you? Because about three days before I'd gotten into a terrible brawl and, and I came out the worst for it. 
I was a, I was a mess. I mean, my eyes were shut, jaw knocked <laughs> off the hinge, nose broken, everything. I was just, I was like, you know, 28 pounds of hamburger meat. It was just uh, <laughs> not a nice sight. And they were like, they were staring at me in horror. So much so that they had to have Polaroids with me. And they were like, <laughs> pumpkin head here. <laughs> anyway, they, uh, they tacked it up on the board and they said, hey, we need freaks for this movie. Come in in about three weeks and we'll see after you heal up, we'll see. And I go, oh, okay, all right. And, and uh, so I did, I went back three weeks later and they were still auditioning. So, hey, they, gave, they handed me the prime part like in five minutes. It was kind of an astounding occurrence, but. And that was, you know, again, you want to know that that was to be such a, a huge hit. I mean, it, it was extraordinary, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It, it was uh, done on a shoestring by yeah. guys who were really kind of ingenious. Uh, none of us really knew wholly what we were doing, but it was, uh, it was kind of the new wave of Australian cinema. It was mm. uh, guys, a, a doctor was directing it. Miller, that's right. Yeah, yeah, he'd gotten his money from a chemist. Uh, <laughs> he was working with acting students with, a, yeah. you know, and it was, um, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a fun experience. It was yeah. nine weeks, like Fast and Furious, and it struck a chord somewhere in the, uh, in the Far East and other places. But, but then off the rails you went. I mean, you started a film career, and then you, you almost blew it at the very well, early yeah, stage. Sure, I mean, it's... What, uh, you, what happened? Well, when you're a young fella, and you, you're out there, and, you know, um, there's a lot of people who want to get around you, and they all got a bunch of interesting new games to play, you know? <laughs> and uh, it's the devil knocking at your door. Like, uh, and of course you think, well, you know, hey, I was a, you know, what, what are you going to do, not do it? Uh, I suppose you could not do it, but I wasn't that kind of person, you know. I have a, I have an alter ego in me called Bjorn. <laughs> Bjorn. Bjorn. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. Uh, and um, who, who is Bjorn? Bjorn is just uh, the kind of like, you know, pillaging sort of Viking in it. <laughs> I think he's in you too. You have an S O N on the end of your name, right? <laughs> Yeah, he's uh, so way back in the dark ages somewhere. I mean, the sins of the father visited on. I know that something is wrong there, but uh, <laughs> Bjorn is a, um, you know, he's, he's an axe murderer. He gets off a boat and <laughs> chops up convents, you know. <laughs> that's, you know, and that, that, that's, that's there. That's in all of us, you know, the wild man kind of, especially in your 20s. I mean, my gosh, you got so much energy. And I found recently the cause of the energy. Uh, what, what? Well, I had this manic energy when I was younger, and I couldn't, I thought, wait, I used to have to sedate it with anything I could find. <laughs> and, uh, this sounds like an excuse, doesn't it? I really enjoyed it. But, but um, I, I had an MRI one time for an appendix, and they go, whoa, like that, and I'm going, yeah, impressive, isn't it? But <laughs> what they were talking about, <laughs> <clears throat> what they were actually talking about was my kidney. I see. Kidneys. And I have a very rare thing. It's like one in a thousand people or something. And it's called a horseshoe kidney. And most people's kidneys are like, you know, you got a kidney here and a kidney here. But I got these kidneys that are so large that they join up like this. And these are your energy organs, man. It's just like rocket fuel. So, um, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so Bjorn's still there. Bjorn's there, but I've, I've done a lot of damage to him. <laughs> Not only that, but I've managed to subdue him, uh, dig a shallow grave in my imagination, insert him in the grave, and every now and then you just gotta go out the backyard, get a few shovels full of dirt, throw it on top and tamp it down just to keep it. Because I tell you, I don't want to be Bjorn again. Or born again. <laughs> but but, <laughs> how, but how, how, what was it, was the one incident, one person who brought you back to heal, to, to sanity, who said, look, this is silly. Oh, yeah. I mean, my wife was telling me for 10 years, why do you drink so much, you know? And it's like, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, uh, and she said, I think you might have a problem. And uh, I'm like, you're out of your mind. I just like a uh, drink. <laughs> you know? and, um, and she was right, you know? It's, uh, it's something that you have to mature and just think, well, you know, I got to get over that. And, it's, and I did, and I feel, you know, it's better. It's just you don't drink at all now? No. You don't? don't. No. How long since you had a drink? Oh, gosh. Years. 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 But it's, uh, and, and it's just better that way. I mean, it's, you enjoy your life. And, and you get to live your life, you know, because if, if you're uh, anesthetized all the time, you're sort of missing out on things. You're not really growing. You're just kind of, you know, shutting it out all the time. It's cowardly. Have you ever contemplated, because you have a, a large family, you have seven children, yeah. and a very stable relationship with, with your wife, you've been married, what, 20 odd years now? 22, 20, yeah, 22. Well, quite obviously, it's that that, that that holds you together, isn't it, in, in the situation that you're in. 
I mean, it's a family against... If you're left to your own devices, in other words, yeah, what sure. would have happened? Oh, I'd have pulled a pin years ago. Would you? <laughs> 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 yeah. not, not, not suicidal, but it's, no. it's not that. But there is certainly a, uh, a self-destructive uh, kind of thing uh, than sort of vaguely Scandinavian, Irish, lowland Scott kind of weirdness going on there. <laughs> and a bad Celtic mix <laughs> with a little Bjorn to throw in just to get it. <laughs> and what, of course, there, there's also a story, too, about uh, that um, your co-star in, in one of the Mad Max movies, the Thunderdome uh, uh, one, uh, Tina Turner, she also pulled you on one side, didn't she? And had a oh, yeah. Oh, she saw it firsthand, of course. I mean, she lived a life of... Uh, uh, she st stayed with a man who was horrible to her. That's right. And uh, she'd seen it, you know. And, yeah. and she saw me, and she handed me a photograph of myself one day. And... Um, um, she'd written on it, you know, with an eyebrow pencil or something. She said, don't F this up on the, on the picture. And I'm like, oh, what does she mean? <laughs> it wasn't too long after that I figured out what she meant. You did, yeah. yeah. OK, well, happy endings we'd all could, because the next movie that you made, you had two years off, in fact, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Recovering your, uh, your place in Australia. And... Sure, I, I'd had a gut full of the whole industry. I mean, it's a very strange place, Holly Weirdwood. Uh, <laughs> but it's... Um, it's an odd place. And you, you imagine all these horror stories there that you think, boy, it seems as if I'm being sacrificed over here. No, that couldn't be true. And then uh, you realize that it is true. And, and you have to, I just left for a while and um, took a couple of years off, bought a place down in Australia and started digging holes and putting up fences and birthing cattle and all this kind of stuff. And it was, it was fun, you know, it was fun. It was, it was great and it was a good breather, you know? Yeah. And then, of course, the, the, the comeback, what a comeback, Lethal Weapon. Yeah. It wasn't bad, was it? it was, yeah, it was all right. It was, <laughs> it was fun. What was nice in, in what, what grew up in, throughout the, the, the movies that you did, the, the Lethal Weapon series, was there was a wonderful sense of slapstick developed as well, wasn't there? I mean, there was you yeah. and Pesky and Lover. I mean, it, yeah. was, it, right. was, it, was, it, was, it was slapstick. It was vaudeville, in a sense. Absolutely. It was like the Three Stooges. I mean, Pesci is like, uh, he's a razor wit. And uh, Danny is always one beat behind. And, uh, and I'm just, I just had too much energy, so I was in the middle, so it was, uh, but, uh, you know, it was fun. It was fun working with those guys. And in truth, some of the scripts were not that great. <laughs> so the idea that we all three of us came up with was just talk over the top of one another and maybe no one will notice. <laughs> uh, just keep the action moving along. It'll seem at least natural and, and you might get some yucks out of it if, uh, uh, so it was a uh, very practiced art. What about the, the uh, reputation that, that you gained on that, uh, on that series of films and, and throughout your career about being a practical joker? I mean, what, what's the strength of this? And what kind of practical jokes did you play in that, in that series? Oh, my God. Oh, I remember one with Pesci where we... Uh, Chris Rock and I... Oh, yeah, this is heinous. Uh, <laughs> well, heinous is almost the word for it. I, we... Uh, well, we polaroided our posteriors with... Uh, with very fine Cuban cigars protruding from them. <laughs> and then uh, we went and gave Pesci a cigar, and he was like a cigar aficionado. He's going, wow, these are like, and he's like, lights it up. And then we showed him the Polaroid. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's sophomoric, uh, silly, crude, silly stuff, but like it amused us, you know. <laughs> I guess we got way too much time on our hands there. And so. <laughs> and are you sending Julia Roberts dead rats and things like oh, that? Oh, yeah. But they were, well, they were actually. It was quite sanitary. It wasn't like I didn't go out to the alley and get it myself or anything. It was, uh, there's a place in, um, in Greenwich Village called Evolution where you can get freeze-dried brown Norwegian rats. And they're perfectly intact and they look so real. They're, all, they're even in different poses, you know? They're like, like Barbie, you know? They're sort of like... Uh, there's ones where they're... Up like this, and then there's other ones like... Uh, along with a cigarette. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty awful. So I got this really nasty rat, and she just, like, the reaction from her every time, because it was the same rat coming back every time. <laughs> First, it was just an outright gift, and she was touched, and she opened it. I left the room, and I just... <laughs> you could hear the screams in Denver, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and then I kept resending it in different packaging. <laughs> and you always knew when she got it, because you could hear it. <laughs> what about the offers that you had about around this time, too, to do James Bond? I mean, were you ever tempted to do that? No, I wasn't, oddly. I was, uh, that was when I was about 26, and I was, I was working with Peter Weir on The Year of Living Dangerously in Australia at the time, and we, we were there, and uh, I got the phone call from Cubby Broccoli, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. They, um, 
called me up. They thought, hey, there's this Australian kid. We could probably get him for cheap. And, uh, and I, I just, I thought, I just didn't want to go that way. You didn't? No. And, uh, I mean, I didn't know where the next job was coming from, but I, I still didn't want to go that way because nobody can outdo Sean in those things. Come on. <laughs> he's, uh, you know, he sort of, he, he put it on the map and you, it would be, you couldn't outdo him. No, it's, it's the imprints there all the time, the voice and everything. Yeah. It's, it's just, yeah. just yeah. Okay, um, now, after Lethal Weapon, you, yeah. you did a curious thing. Many thought a suicidal thing. You did Hamlet. Oh, hamster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, it, it, it would seem to be, I, I suppose to many people, a kind of a perverse choice, I mean, going the way that your career was going. And I'm sure that mm. your agent and people advisor around you didn't say to, hey, that's a great idea, doing Hamlet. So how did it, how did it come about? Well, my agent is uh, this guy called Ed Lamato, and he also, he's a friend of Franco Zeffirelli's. And I said, yeah, I think I want to do this. He said, well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you should do this, uh, Hamlet. I mean, Shakespeare, for God's sake, uh, you know. I mean, this is this is a town where, you know, they do films of like Branagh's Henry V. You know, they'll send it out there, and they'll be trying to sell it in the market, and some executive will get on the phone and say, "Well, what did Henry IV do?" <laughs> you know, that's like, you know, that's like Scream 15 or something. But um, I, he didn't know whether it was a good idea, but you know, he went with it. And but it worked, didn't it? It. On, at a certain level. Yes. I mean, uh, it, I, I think the best thing you can say about it is that it's very accessible. It's certainly short. <laughs> it's, about, it's about two and a quarter hours instead of, you know, four and a half. Yes. Which it should be if you do it in complete uh, form. And it, it's, it's very visually nice, but Franco's really good with that stuff. Yes. No, you, you in fact, got plans, I think, to direct uh, Hamlet, haven't you, yourself? Yeah, I do, I, see, because I feel I didn't do it, but I wanted to, to direct it with Robert Downey Jr. in it. Because I think that's just such a great idea. I mean, this guy is, he would, he's, I don't know, he's a, he's a brilliant guy. I mean, he's a kind of a genius. I think he's close to a genius. And um, he's a troubled guy, but, uh, uh, and has a, a uh, he's doing tremendously well. You know, he's got a lot of bad press for being the bad boy and stuff, but I've known him for years, and he has got, he is such a great person and a great spirit, and he's got such a huge heart. Um, he just has a weakness. He's got a Bjorn inside him, hasn't he? Hey, we all got Bjorn. He's, yeah. got, he's got more Bjorn than I do. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I'd love to do that one day with him. Maybe we'll both get a little older and do it, but he's still young enough to do it, you know. Now, what about the, the, the direction? Because you uh, directed the... It wasn't the first film you directed, but the most successful film you directed was, was Braveheart. Yeah. Now, it was immense success. It got you a, an Oscar. It got an Oscar for Best Picture as well. Mm -hmm. But what about the, the, the pressure on you of uh, directing and starring in the movie? Directing, starring and producing. It's, if you're going to wear three hats, it's advisable to grow another two heads. <laughs> um, uh, it, it was a pretty heavy workload. I, I got some greys out of it. Grey hairs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There's, no, no. <laughs> I mean, they're there. <laughs> but how, how authentic was it in the, in the sense of the, of the castles that you built and the, the kind of weapons and that sort of thing? Oh, I think the, the, the set design was amazing and the weapons were amazingly accurate, as was the set designer. The blue faces is totally like... Um, you know, <laughs> that was just kind of some earlier woad period. Uh, you know, when the Romans found the, the Celts here, they were all blue and druidic. Uh. So there was a... I just like that idea. It was more savage somehow to me. Oh, yeah, well, it was American well, Indian War yeah. paint. Yeah. Uh, but it has this wonderful connotation in this country, sort of like football fans. You know, yeah. Going to, oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's how I conceived that battle was like very much like a sporting event so that everybody knew what side, everybody with, you know, different colored uniforms. Would you be tempted to do that again, too, to actually produce and direct and, and star in a film? Or is that, having done that, is that too much? That's, that's the. Wow, I'm running out of kidneys, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it not to that degree. Perhaps I'd do it again, but not on something as huge as that. It was, it was very uh, taxing. Now, what, what about all this, uh, th this position you're at, at now, where, you know, your box office, your huge box office star, you can pick and choose what you want to do, mm -hmm. and you have all these wonderful labels hung around your neck, so sexiest man in the world. Yeah, no, that one's in here. That's a good one, isn't it? It's a nice one. <clears throat> I just, just wondered. You know, it's a, you know, when I was, I think I was like 25 or 26 when they, you know, hung that one on me. And I, would, I resented it. I thought, oh, no. Now I've got to live up to that. Um, <clears throat> which, of course, you can't. The whole notion is ridiculous. And I realize, of course, now that it's just put out there to sell 
publications, you know. Uh, but there's a dark corner of Bjorn that's sort of like the flattery. Uh, as he'd winter in a convent. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I mean, what you managed to do is not take any of it seriously, isn't it? All that's kind of... That's no, you stuff. can't. I mean, if you, if you began to take that seriously, what kind of creature would you become? Yes. I mean, it would be, you'd, I'd, I'd, yeah, I couldn't even wake up in the morning and look at myself. Mind you, if you took it seriously, it wouldn't bother you, I suppose. No. I, I, read, I read a story, too, that, that in your office, in your of your production company, you've got all the stills from the movies, but you yeah. put moustaches on all of them. <laughs> yeah. I just whip around and draw a moustache on everyone. But everyone. You know, anyone's photograph has a moustache on it. Uh, I don't know why. It's just a... I suppose it's part I of I guess this. I just haven't got enough to do. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose it's part of this thing about keep, be, keeping sane in, in, in Hollywood, because you are saying earlier, but it is an extraordinary place. I mean, it is not yeah. like anywhere else on this planet. Sure. And different rules uh, uh, relate, and, and it will be very easy to actually be absorbed by it and become that thing. Indeed. It is, um, yeah, a very odd place. But if, if, you, if you become knowledgeable about it, you can navigate your way through it and do all right. It just takes a little while. Uh, my partner and I went in there maybe 13, 14 years ago now, and we, we kicked off a production company and has, it's grown over the years. It's become, you know, very, very, we've got, um, it's here in the UK, it's down in Australia. It's, it's fantastic. He's done a great job with it. And uh, we were so badly brutalized by, <laughs> by deals and studios and other operators. I mean, the woods are full of wolves and it's like, uh, but we used to get ripped off all the time and we'd just look at each other and go, school fees and move on. <laughs> and and uh, that's truly what it is. But that, it's that kind of town. Yes. What about your, your, your family? You mentioned that you've got three, seven children in your family, a very close-knit family. Yeah. Again, the problems there of bringing up your family in this very, very unreal world. Sure. Well, um, of course, uh, for a good deal of their lives, they were raised in Australia on a farm. I mean, they were trying yes. to figure out, hey, what's that long black thing with a red belly on it? Get away from it! <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, just a, quite a simple existence, and they enjoyed it, and so that... Uh, the whole sort of uh, Los Angeles experience is different from them. They're hybrids, which is good. Um, uh, they have the sophistication that they can glean from sort of looking around them. And there's the, there's the, there's the bad aspects of it, too. Um, but I've always tried to foster in them a sense of, um, you know, if they want some extra pocket money, you know, I'll kick them out the door and they can go and work for it, you know? But uh, is that possible? Sure it is. Is it? Sure. Go up to the local restaurant, see if you can get a job as a busboy. Um, go and do this, go and do, you know, and, and, uh, and they, I think they appreciate that. So you're a very old-fashioned father from that point of view. Well, I, I, we tend, I guess, to teach what we were taught, and um, that's the way I got it. I mean, nobody gave me a big old handout, and it was, um, I mean, if they're in trouble, I'm there. You sure. Know? And, uh, but it's, it's certainly, I don't think it does them much good to, to coddle them too much. You have to throw them out into it a little bit. It hurts. But there you go. Do you refer back to your, to your old childhood as well, all the time? To my own? Yes. Oh, of course, yeah. You do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you, you think back, well, that's, yes, that, that's, that's a touchstone. Your dad recently got married. He did. Yeah, he's right. 80, 83 years old. He got married. <laughs> Has he got a big kidney, too? Oh. <laughs> I would imagine that he has a very large kidney. kidney. <laughs> and and, and uh, he, he um, uh, you know, my mother passed away like 12 years ago, and he, you know, he's lonely. And, and yes. you know, he's 83 years old. Yeah. He cradle snatched a woman who's 68 years old, <laughs> um, swept her off on his white horse, and they're as happy as they just laugh like a couple of kids. It's so fantastic. I just can't. Uh... So both your parents lived to see you make a success. So that's good. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that must have been gr give you great satisfaction. It did, yeah. And them too, I imagine. And yeah. they, they were able to uh, enjoy the fruits of. Yeah, you know, my son the dentist, my son the act, you know, all that stuff. All yeah. that stuff, yeah. Now, um, going back to, to bringing up, up children, uh, there's a, the theme of one of your films, What Women Want, was part of this, a subplot, was your relationship with your, with your daughter yeah. in the film. Um, wh what about this relationship in, in, in real life? I mean, what happens when teenage daughters come to you and, you know, they've got, I don't know, studs in their nose? Nose or... Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> hmm. It's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting dilemma. I mean, there's a friend of mine who his daughter came back and, I don't know, she's 15 or 16, and, she had like a tattoo just at the top of the 
of her buttocks, uh, of a flower or something, and he took her straight out and he dragged her into a place and made her get it lasered off, which was like pretty extreme. I don't know if I could do that, but, um, but she know he means business now uh, when he tells her something. Um, you know, she said, can I get a belly button ring and all that? And I said, no. It's your daughter. Yeah, of course you're gonna say no. And uh, uh, she did it anyway, you know. <laughs> One day she's reaching up to grab something. I said, uh, what's that? And she's like, oh, <laughs> you know. But she's 21 now. She threw it away two years ago. Yeah. yeah. Are, are you very comfortable in the company of, of, of women? Nah, I become more so, I think. But, but uh, I certainly didn't kick off that way. And everyone says, well, you had a lot of sisters and a mother and all that, which, of course, I did. Everyone has a mother, I guess. But um, uh, it's still, I was terrible with women. I was incredibly shy. Were you? Young, oh, yeah. I couldn't. Uh, I had to get half sloshed before I could even talk to one, you know. So it was, uh, um, uh, which is unfortunate. Yes. Yeah. Too bad. It certainly was very limiting. So when you yeah. were this, this teenager growing up, then you were just, you were the wallflower, were you were sitting in? A little bit. I sort of had a couple of sweethearts, you know. But uh, I wasn't like a, you know, a raging around kind of lady killer or anything. And um, um, I just uh, didn't really know how to talk to them at all. It's interesting. And when did you learn how to do that? I'm still working on it. You are, eh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I've, I've been practicing for 22 years. Like, now, what is the combination here? It's not always as obvious as one might think. It's very, it's very, uh, yeah. There's some, there's some very tricky waters to navigate there. But you must. I mean, I mean there must have there would come a time when you, you understood that you were very attractive to women. That women were attracted to you. Well, other people would tell me that, but I'd be like, I don't know. I, I still couldn't kind of like, I don't know. It was. A, I would never ask anyone out on a date ever. It was like, uh, you know. Just, you know, porridge by yourself on Saturday night. Oh. No milk, no oh. sugar, oh. no shoes. No, no, it's, it's getting me here. No, I can't take too much of this. No, I really can't. You know what that is? Well, that's the smallest violin in the world. So, <laughs> I'll believe it. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll... Either that or a booger. I'm... <laughs> okay, well then, so what, what's, what's in the pipeline? You've got another film, haven't you? Have, have you finished the film about the corn circles? Yeah, I did a, a film with uh, M. Night Shyamalan. Um, he did that, The Sixth Sense and, and, uh, and Break Unbreakable. But he yes. did this one called Signs, and it's kind of a... Wow, it's the only time I've ever read a script and called a guy up in five minutes and said, Hire me! Uh, fortunately, he sent it to me. Uh, <laughs> so that, that was... I had an inroad there. So. But I mean, what, what's, what's what about you, the actor? I mean, as, as you... Oh, as, as an you, actor. As you grow to more maturity, yeah. and you get a few more grey hairs like yeah. I've got, I mean... Yeah. There's, what do you think about Spencer Tracy parts, perhaps? Or? Yeah, maybe, maybe. I, I, that, it's interesting. It, it, it doesn't... Um, and I still love it. I've always loved it. I love being in action, but I really enjoy the directing thing, and it, it's like... Uh, I'm really thinking about slowing down on the, you know, face-out-front stuff and, and then maybe going behind the camera and, and, and uh, urging younger, fitter fellows to sort of get out there and do it and, and be a part of it that way, because it's the story-telling pro uh, process that I really love. You know? mm. Um, and, <laughs> and I just don't take the falls as well as I used to. <laughs> you could do intellectual stuff, but what's the fun in that? <laughs> um, but isn't the, I mean, wouldn't you miss that, that wonderful adrenaline that there is in, in performing? I mean, that's the reason why you, you continue, why anybody performs in the end, is that there's, you can't replace, replicate that, that, that buzz. Yeah. It's kind of hard to get lost in it on film because they do it in such piecemeal fashion, but, um, I'd, I'd like to crawl on the boards again one time. Oh, well, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, have you yeah. thought, I mean, lots of, uh, of stars, a few stars have come to London and, and gone into a theatre, 235 quid a week. Yeah. You'd find that tempting, wouldn't you? Yeah, no, no, I would. You Actually, would, yeah, would you? Yeah, there's, there's a real thrill to that. I mean, that was my first love, and that's how I was trained for the stage, in fact. Uh, the last time I was on stage, I think, uh, was in 1984. It was with Warren Mitchell. In a... I saw it. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Death of a Salesman. Yeah. And that's, you played Biff. Yeah, that's the last time I, I saw you in Sydney. It was, it was good. I mean, Warren was, was marvelous, and you were too. It was great. Yeah. Good it's like 17 years ago. It's just like, what happens to the time? Well, my children are taller than I am now. So. <laughs> Not hard. And I'd like to... <laughs> I, hey, come on, I'd like to clear up a rumor. Go on, go on. Come on, we're about the same size. Uh-huh. Here, stand up. Okay. Maybe... <laughs> Now, either he's a runt like me, 
But they're lying about both of us. That's right. They, I've always had this short thing. I like. They have you down at five foot seven. Five they? six or something. Yeah. Five six. They, yeah. Because I must say that before I met you, yeah. I read this and I thought, well, you know, really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you weren't. But when I met you, I could see that you were. You were not, and there are no lifts. You're the new. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I mean, wonder why that got around. I mean, why would that be? I don't know. It just makes good copy, I suppose. They had this article one time, the incredible shrinking bond, and they had Sean, and then they had Roger, and then they had Timothy, and they were all going down on the height chart, you know, till they got to me, and I was like little bigger than, you know, grumpy, and it was, <laughs> it was like, hey, come on, guys, hey. I want to, I mean, but some people, some film stars are very cautious about their size, aren't they? Because yeah. I won't mention names, but I was actually once instructed that when this star, particular star, walked on, I was not allowed to stand up. Oh. <laughs> and, and even sitting down, I was taller than him. So. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was... Well, DeVito's like that. He's touching. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you, you cleared that up. Yeah, I mean, me too. That, wow. that'll hey, be, a... I mean, that's probably the reason why I did the, the, the program, just to say it there right at the go. end. This is it. Okay. Should we get a measure, tape measure in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, all the best uh, in, in the future. All the best with your, with your movie. Yeah. It's been... Uh, Thank you. It's been great talking to you. I much, much enjoyed it. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Mel Gibson. My thanks to the very tall Mel Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> Until then, from all of us here, a very good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>